Uh, before I begin, I want to thank CSC's director, Mike Conan, for inviting me to give this introduction and have this chance to catch up virtually with John Seidel, of whom I have fond memories from back in the 1990s when we were renting rooms in the same sprawling Quezon City compound while he was researching Philippine political bosses and I was working on the causes of the Philippines' many coups. So it's my great pleasure to introduce John Seidel, who's one of the world's leading specialists in Southeast Asian politics and who holds the Sir Patrick Gilliam Chair in International Politics, note that word politics, at the London School of Economics. After studying politics as an undergraduate at Yale and as a graduate student at Cornell, John has pursued a seemingly diverse series of topics in his wide ranging study of Southeast Asia's political process ranging from close-grained studies of Philippine bossism, Filipino criminals, and Manila's clogged car traffic, all the way to the region's broadest problems of sovereignty, oligarchy, and the origins of its many re modern revolutions, the subject of his recent book. Now, after he spent 30 years doing dozens upon dozens of these close, careful studies of Southeast Asian politics, I was struck by the fact that the title of John's talk today ends with, I think, the weighted words, and let me quote, dot, 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 in the study of Southeast Asian history. Why, we might ask, is such a prominent political scientist speaking about the region's history instead of its politics? And indeed, why is this political scientist's most recent book probing a probing historical study of Southeast Asia's nationalist and communist movements over the span of a century. Thinking it over, I realized that it seems likely that John, and he may object, but he can do that later, that John, like most scholars, is writing within a longer, deeper intellectual tradition that both informs and inspires his continuing quest for intellectual innovation. In his case, and indeed the case of Southeast Asian studies in general. The source of that intellectual tradition, I feel can be traced to Cornell University where John, as I mentioned, did his doctorate. From the time the field of Southeast Asian studies first emerged during the early 1950s at Cornell, it was distinctly interdisciplinary, merging anthropology, politics, and history into a single analytical paradigm that was both supple and I think powerful. In that era, the prominent political scientists at Cornell, George Cahan and later Ben Anderson, were the progenitors of this yeasty interdisciplinary intellectual synthesis, which they propagated by infusing in their influential publications and in their successful students, who went on to carry the field and its distinctive paradigm to universities in America, Europe, and Australia. One of the most successful of these students was Harry Benda, who did his doctorate in political science under George Cain at Cornell, and then won an appointment as a history professor at Yale. When I came to Yale as a grad student in the 1970s, Harry Benda had already made a seamless transition from political science to history, and as my supervisor introduced me to Cornell's distinctly interdisciplinary approach to the study of Southeast Asia's history. If you wish to gain a, a sense of the continuing vitality and the sheer intellectual power, of this interdisciplinary paradigm that still lies, I think, at the core of Southeast Asian studies. Let me refer to you to John's recently published book titled Republicanism, Communism, Islam, Cosmopolitan Origins of Revolution in Southeast Asia. Now, instead of the usual notice for an academic monograph, which is most often limited to a querulous critical notice in the back pages of some obscure academic journal many years after publication, John's book has merited just last month, a long review in the New Yorker, in many ways our country's premier intellectual journal that celebrates the way that John, whom the reviewer correctly identifies as a student of Ben Anderson, uh, and the, the reviewer says that the book adds fresh background to our understanding of how the region's national revolutions benefited from a kind of multi-generational struggle that carried countries like Indonesia and Vietnam from the miseries of colonialism to the perils of independence. It's thus with great pleasure that I introduce Professor John Seidel, who will draw upon his deep training in political science within, his within this interdisciplinary tradition 
to speak on an expressly historical topic titled Cosmopolitanism and Comparisons in the Study of Southeast Asian History. John, thank you. Um, many thanks, Al, um, for that very generous introduction and also for the, the pleasure of your company after too many years, albeit uh, remotely. And many thanks to Siasi and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at University of Wisconsin for uh, the invitation and for hosting uh, this talk as well. Um, what I'd like to do today is to give a talk that focuses in considerable measure on some of the arguments uh, and evidence I put forward in this book that's just been published uh, that Al mentioned, Republicanism, Communism, Islam, Cosmopolitan Origins of Revolution in Southeast Asia, but to try and situate it within Southeast Asian studies in a way that links quite directly and uh, you know, very, very much, uh, very clearly to what Al just uh, provided as a backdrop in which Harry Benda and uh, Cornell University's sort of role in the making of Southeast Asian studies in the latter half of the 20th century uh, is foregrounded uh, in a context that, you know, perhaps goes beyond the book and, and to the, the study of Southeast Asia as a region more generally. So let me do the traditional thing and throw up some PowerPoint slides. Um, okay. So it seems to me that if you look at the uh, the state of Southeast Asian studies in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, as Al suggested, and as I experienced as a, uh, an undergraduate at Yale and then a, a PhD student at Cornell, uh, it seemed to me that Southeast Asian studies during those 50 years uh, was characterized by two very distinctive, but also interrelated preoccupations. Uh, and on the one hand, uh, it seems to me that one very strong preoccupation uh, of the study of Southeast Asia, including the study of Southeast Asian history, uh, was a preoccupation with uh, something like authenticity, uh, indigeneity, or uh, perhaps as the late great uh, University of Wisconsin historian of Southeast Asia, John Smale talked about it, uh, autonomy. Um, the idea being that uh, Southeast Asia um, was not simply a kind of second rate derivative, uh, you know, region that borrowed shamelessly and seamlessly from the great civilizations uh, which surrounded it, India to the west, China to the north, uh, and that if Southeast Asian studies at the time was a kind of Orientalism for the most part, one might say, uh, it was not a kind of second rate Orientalism, that Southeast Asia had its own traditions. It's had its own, shall we say, essence, um, such that you really needed to understand Southeast Asia and Southeast Asians rather than just assume that uh, Southeast Asians borrowed and imitated traditions and civilizations uh, from without, whether it would be uh, Chinese style, so-called Confucianism or Buddhism uh, or Hinduism uh, or Islam or Catholicism and so forth. And, uh, and we can see this kind of preoccupation uh, in uh, writings by O.W. Walters, his famous article on Khmer Hinduism, where he suggests that the Hinduism that you find by the eighth century in what's now Cambodia was as much Khmer as it was Hindu, or uh, Clifford Geert's famous religion of Java, where he, he sort of deconstructs the notion of Islam on Java and suggests the distinctly Javanese forms of religion, uh, even uh, avowedly uh, Islamic uh, religious practices and understandings. And of course, Vince Raphael's famous book, Contracting Colonialism, where he shows that Philippine Catholicism, or at least Tagalog Catholicism and uh, Tagalog speaking areas of Luzon uh, is very much uh, distinctive in the kind of distinctly Filipino forms of Catholic experience and understanding and consciousness uh, observed. So in all these ways, there's a kind of preoccupation with showing that Southeast Asia is uh, a distinctive region with its own internal 
uh, logics, its own internal, perhaps essence, its, its own sort of uh, operative uh, understandings and cultures that you need to understand as opposed to just being able to read it as a carbon copy of one or another ism, uh, great tradition religion, or for that matter, you know, communism, uh, liberalism, uh, and so forth from without. But a second preoccupation that uh, it seemed to me was very strong in the study of Southeast Asia uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, most notably in the context of the Cold War, was a preoccupation with nationalism and a preoccupation that was not only intellectual but political. Uh, a, a preoccupation in the context of right-wing McCarthyist and otherwise conservative uh, American critiques of Southeast Asia and Southeast Asians as uh, fellow travelers of communism, uh, of uh, a, a region understood in terms of resistance to colonialism and imperialism uh, in the name of, of something that underneath it all was really communist and on the wrong side of the Cold War. And against this backdrop and against this kind of understanding, scholars of Southeast Asia uh, at universities like Cornell and uh, Yale and University of Wisconsin and other, other such universities uh, suggested that instead that the driving force of Southeast Asian politics was really nationalism. Uh, and that in order to understand uh, Southeast Asian resistance to colonialism, Southeast Asian resistance to imperialism, you had to appreciate the strength uh, of nationalist sentiment and nationalist forms of politics in the region. And so it's against this backdrop, this kind of intellectual and political backdrop that we see published in 1983, the single most uh, influential, important, uh, interesting, and illuminating study of nationalism uh, in the field uh, by Benedict Anderson, a product of Cornell University Southeast Asia program, uh, a student, as Al McCoy noted, of, of, uh, uh, of George Cahan, who wrote the book on nationalism uh, and, the, and the Indonesian revolution. And Ben Anderson's book, Imagined Communities, uh, took off uh, after its publication in 1983 and became one of the most important uh, books really published uh, in the study of politics and history and cultural studies and so forth in the late 20th century. But for purposes of Southeast Asian studies and in particular for the study of Southeast Asian history, it seems to me, um, Imagine Communities also provided a kind of template for understanding Southeast Asian history, at least modern Southeast Asian history. Uh, basically, uh, this template begins with uh, a period that precedes uh, what we think of as the colonial era that leads up from the early modern era into the, the mid 19th century, uh, during which time you see perhaps embryonic forms of crystallizing um, dynastic realms with some would say increasing coherence and increasing sort of catchment areas, but basically broadly construed dynastic realms without forms of national consciousness uh, really in evidence. So by Anderson's account, actually nationalism is a recent and modern phenomenon. And then by his account and by the, the logic of this template, we begin to see in the latter half of the 19th century and up through the first four decades of the 20th century, the emergence of modern, mostly colonial states whose construction of administer, administrative structures of bureaucracies and relatedly whose uh, elaboration of school systems, whose extension of what he called vernacular languages of state provides the basis for fields of shared experience and socialization and consciousness and in due course, emotional attachment uh, that prefigures at least makes possible uh, the rise of forms of nationalist, not only consciousness, but nationalist mobilization and transitions to uh, new independent nation states uh, by the late 1940s and 1950s across Southeast Asia. And so, Anderson's account then provides a kind of telos, a kind of logical template uh, 
um, around which one can quite usefully organize uh, the study or indeed the teaching of uh, modern Southeast Asian history of nation by nation as we begin to see the making of, of new nation states uh, as a kind of organizing principle for our understanding uh, of Southeast Asian history up into the, the, the mid years uh, of the 20th century. But it seems to me that this template for all of its illuminative power, for all of its um, compelling coherence and convenient coherence, uh, that it leaves unanswered uh, at least two questions uh, that I don't think it can answer in its own terms. And the first of these two questions is how can we explain the tremendous variance that we observe uh, in modern Southeast Asian history, especially in terms of the kind of pathways to independence that we observe from the, the late 19th century up into the middle of the 20th century? How can we explain why in some countries we see uh, impressive instances and extended periods of revolutionary mobilization. The Philippines in, in the final years of the 19th century, uh, Indonesia uh, in uh, the latter half of the 1940s, uh, Vietnam uh, certainly from 1946 up until 1954 and onwards of course to 1975 if we extend uh, the struggle up to the uh, unification or reunification of Vietnam uh, in that year. Um, and we could also add to that, that list uh, the case of, of Burma, today's Myanmar, uh, where we see large-scale mass mobilization leading up to independence in 1947. Whereas by contrast, there are other parts of Southeast Asia uh, where we see a much more staged managed pattern of decolonization leading to a form of independence that many derided uh, at the time and, and today as a form of neo-colonialism. And here some would include the Philippines with its transition uh, to independence in 1946, or indeed the case of Malaysia, which Lee Kuan Yew famously derided uh, as you know, independence that was granted by British royalty, you know, on, on a silver platter by British royalty, um, you know, in a bed of roses, something like that. So in other words, how can we, how can we then explain this tremendous variance in terms of what does and doesn't happen uh, in, in terms of nationalism? Is it that some countries are just more nationalist than others? Looking at Anderson's template and thinking in terms of the logic of the elaboration of uh, different administrative structures uh, and accompanying school systems and languages of state, it doesn't quite account for that tremendous variance, uh, the, the, the tremendous differences that we observe across the region in how and when and in what kind of form uh, we see uh, independence achieved. And then the second question that perhaps is uh, is even more um, uh, problematic is the question of participation in those instances of large scale mass mobilization in revolutionary struggles leading to independence. After all, if you read Anderson's account, um, you, you not only discover that by his account, nationalism is much more circumscribed historically to the, the modern era, there's historically a lot less nationalism uh, in Southeast Asia and in most regions of the world, or perhaps all regions of the world until the modern era. Nationalist consciousness is a, a, a modern phenomenon. But it's also the case that Anderson's account suggests quite clearly that insofar as Southeast Asians are beginning to think of themselves, imagine themselves in national terms as Filipinos, as Indonesians, as Vietnamese and so forth, uh, they're doing so not only late in the game, but in the small numbers uh, that we find among a very narrow sliver, a narrow segment uh, of society, namely highly educated uh, men, right? Who go to schools, who join the bureaucracies, who are socialized into precisely those sorts of circuitries of the modern state and uh, modern education uh, that would make it possible for them to imagine themselves in national terms. And thus, uh, the, the, the question about uh, the ordinary people, 
um, uh, who participated in these mass struggles uh, remains uh, unanswered, perhaps unanswerable in, in the terms of his account. After all, Anderson opens the book, uh, Imagined Communities in 1983, telling readers that uh, peasants in Cambodia and Vietnam, in his words, couldn't care a fig, couldn't give a fig uh, about uh, the, the borders between the two countries or these issues of, of national uh, identity uh, and national territory and so forth. And thus, if in fact the only people who are, are really nationalist when we see the Philippine Revolution erupting in 1896 or the Indonesian Revolusi erupting in 1945 are these rather dandyish figures in their beautifully pressed, uh, starched, um, you know, linen suits, uh, then, you know, how did you get all of these other people uh, out there uh, on the streets uh, and uh, armed and mobilized for struggles, quite impressive struggles, um, you know, in the towns and villages, uh, in the far-flung hinterlands and mountains uh, of these countries. So the, the tendency in the literature um, in terms of trying to answer the, these questions, uh, it seems to me, is uh, to go back to one of those prevailing tendencies in Southeast Asian studies um, to, uh, to kind of focus on those ineffably indigenous forms of uh, representation and consciousness uh, among the peasant masses uh, and to suggest that there's some kind of connection and some kind of compulsion that draws uh, ordinary people into these revolutionary struggles uh, in, on the basis of understandings and sentiments and attachments that are rather different from those that we identify with the elitist Andersonian nationalism of imagined communities. And here I'm thinking of Ray Leto's book, Passion and Revolution, where he suggests that a distinctly Filipino or Tagalog notion of kalayaan or freedom is informing you know, peasant uh, participation, uh, a certain, certain forms of, of sort of folk Christianity uh, and notions of uh, kalayaan uh, are, are really what explains it. Or likewise, Ben Anderson's own 1972 book, Java in a Time of Revolution, where he emphasizes the, the role of uh, Javanese youth uh, and certain forms of uh, traditional conceptions of power deeply rooted in Javanese culture. Or I think uh, quite helpfully, we see Alexander Woodside's account of community and revolution in modern Vietnam, where he says, no amount of statistics, rhetoric, or social science theory can explain the Vietnamese revolution adequately if its properties of acute historical consciousness and cultural pride are insufficiently considered. In other words, ordinary Filipinos, uh, Indonesians, and Vietnamese uh, participated in these revolutions uh, for reasons that, that are deeply rooted in local culture, uh, essentially, and are rather different from the kind of uh, elite nationalism uh, modern constructed imagined nationalism uh, that we find in imagined communities. And somehow the two uh, are, are, are joined together um, and, and that that must sort of account for what we observe. And, and this, this leaves open though, if, if we take on board these the kind of split level, you know, revolutionary mobilization, elites thinking one thing, masses thinking some, something else. One can think of, for example, Jim Scott's uh, writings on uh, the revolution within the revolution. And the possibility is that, of course, within any form of mobilization, revolutionary or otherwise, participants are, are thinking and acting and representing themselves in, in a variety of different ways. But this still leaves open the question of how things were held together um, and how it was possible to to hold together or not hold together one or another form of revolutionary mobilization. Uh, and also it, it still leaves open the question of the differences uh, between these revolutions and the revolutions that didn't happen. What was it about either elite or mass uh, consciousness that really explains uh, the tremendous variance in what we see in terms of revolutionary and non-revolutionary uh, trajectories 
to and past independence. And here it seems to me it's also worth noting something else. Um, and that is that if we, if, if we take, for example, perhaps the most famous and um, what would we say, uh, the most famous lionized celebrated instance of successful mobilization, revolutionary mobilization uh, against colonial rule uh, and uh, indeed, uh, you know, for independence, uh, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, right? Uh, an instance of uh, actual, you know, conventional, more or less conventional warfare that achieved uh, victory uh, over French forces uh, and, and did so at great cost and in ways that were then celebrated um, uh, in, in, in many parts of the world. And here we see a, a body of recent scholarship that tells us two things about Dien Bien Phu. On the one hand, we have studies by scholars like Chen Jian and Chang Zhai, who tell us that in fact, uh, Dien Bien Phu uh, was a battle where Chinese advisors, Chinese strategic thinking, Chinese logistical and military assistance played a crucial role. And I, I, I don't think there's, there's much that questions uh, the veracity and, and the, the evidence uh, and the logic uh, that, is, that has been mustered in support of that conclusion. And on the other hand, we have an interesting recent book by an historian, uh, Christian Lentz, uh, that shows us that on the ground, the coolie laborers and the foot soldiers, the, by the tens of thousands, who made it possible to transport all of the war material uh, and, and sort of lay siege and maintain the siege in Dien Bien Phu, uh, that tens, and uh, tens of thousands of them were not even ethnic Vietnamese or Vietnamese speaking at all. So the possibility that they were engaged in, in this heroic, uh, impressive form of mass mobilization at Dien Bien Phu, uh, you know, it, it, it's clearly very difficult to attribute that to some deeply rooted Vietnamese cultural nationalism when they, they weren't even Vietnamese. So against this backdrop, um, uh, what I've tried to do in the book um, is to suggest a different kind of template for understanding the broad sweep of modern Southeast Asian history and within it, uh, the, the variegated trajectories of revolutionary mobilization in the three countries that I cover with varying, uh, in, in varying detail or at varying length in, in the book. And, and this template is not really in contradiction to the template that one can extract from imagined communities for studying Southeast Asian history, it's complementary, perhaps in, in, in both senses of the word complementary with an I and an E. And it's also a, a template that is not at all by any stretch of the imagination original. Rather, it's a composite, a synthesis um, that's based on my reading of more than two decades of historical research uh, that you begin to see already at the latest by the 1990s uh, and onwards up to, the, to this day with uh, younger generations uh, still, some of them finishing their PhDs or recently minted PhD students, um, producing really interesting and impressive uh, research that I, I draw together in the book and that I think uh, constitutes already on its own without, without my uh, intervention a kind of alternative template that's there in the literature. And here, this, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of template is based not on an emphasis on the rise of modern states and the emergence of nationalism and nations that we find uh, with imagined communities, but instead it's based on an emphasis on long distance commerce, uh, on the integration of the region into the world economy uh, and the transformation of the region with uh, capitalism, um, but also an emphasis on diverse cosmopolitan connections and connectedness beyond the region. And so we can see this in terms of uh, Southeast Asian history up into the early modern era from let's say the mid 14th century up through the mid 19th century with expanding trade giving rise to various forms of cosmopolitanism, what Sheldon Pollock describes as the Sanskrit cosmopolis, um, even before the early modern era, 
Ronit Ricci describes as the Arabic cosmopolis as Southeast Asia is drawn into the orbit uh, of the uh, Muslim world. Uh, the so-called sinographic uh, cosmopolis uh, and uh, we can, or the, the sinosphere as some call it, and also uh, what I think might be termed the Catholic cosmopolitanism that we find in some think of the, the so-called Jesuit Republic of Letters uh, and so forth. And here, although Anderson's Imagined Communities talks about a pre-national, uh, pre-nationalized, pre-nationalist world of cosmopolitan consciousness, uh, I think, you know, in, in, in terms of broad religious communities, buried in his account is, is something that I think is, is, is further worthy of emphasis here. And that is the forms of scholastic cosmopolitanism that perhaps academics like me um, are somehow attracted to um, and impressed by in terms of their longevity. And here we could think of the, the centuries over which um, Islamic scholasticism is produced and reproduced in schools in madrasas and different forms of uh, communications uh, and correspondence, pilgrimage, uh, and, and other forms of practice uh, in small conclaves and in, in embryonic school systems uh, across the Muslim world. We could think of the, uh, the study of the so-called four books and five classics uh, in the Confucian or Neo-Confucian tradition uh, that of course extends into Vietnam over the centuries. Um, and we could also think uh, of Buddhist um, uh, counterparts in terms of Pali um, uh, schools over the centuries and various forms of Catholic schools and seminaries um, over the same, uh, the same period. And it seems to me that the varied legacies of these different forms of cosmopolitanism are in some measure determinant uh, of the trajectories and outcomes of revolutionary mobilization in Southeast Asia, as I'll uh, make clear in due course. But really it's the transportation and communications revolutions of the latter half of the 19th century and the first four decades uh, of the 20th century and the deepening integration of Southeast Asia into the world economy during this period uh, that overshadows these older cosmopolitanisms uh, and overlays them uh, with new ones in concrete institutional forms which provide new modern infrastructures for mobilization. The tightening integration of Southeast Asia into the world economy, after all, created market societies with the accelerated growth of port cities and market towns in their hinterlands in line with the accelerating flow of capital, commodities, and labor. Here I'm thinking of that great book that Al, you, and Ed de Jesus uh, published in what, 1982, uh, about the, the different port cities. Uh, of the Philippines and what happened during this period as a good example. Mike has a very interesting piece there as well. And these trends did not simply couple colonies and metropoles, it's worth noting, into ever more intimate and intense dyadic embraces, the Philippines and Spain, the Dutch East Indies and the Netherlands, Vietnam and France, but rather these trends open the floodgates to really very diverse forms of economic interactions uh, and other influences. So we find the, the prevalence of British and German trade in the Philippines, vastly overshadowing Spanish trade in the latter half of the 19th century. We see the importance of non-Dutch plantations and indeed up throughout the 19th century, the significance of Singapore uh, as a key port and processing center for outer island uh, commodities in, in the Netherlands, East Indies. And if we think of Vietnam, it's important to note uh, the, how uh, the Vietnamese economy uh, and Vietnamese society is in unprecedented ways drawn into a, a broader arc uh, of what the French called Indochine or Indochina. Um, with the Western movement of uh, Vietnamese into what today uh, constitute Cambodia and Laos. Uh, the French colonial enterprise in Vietnam used Vietnam as a launching pad for Southern China. And the entire economy uh, of uh, 
uh, colonial Vietnam was symbiotically linked to that of Guangzhou and Guangdong uh, in, in southern China. Um, we can also note the, the deepening integration by the 1920s and 1930s of the Vietnamese economy, not only into Indochine and southern China, but also into the broader arc of the French empire. If you look at shipping routes, if you look at uh, bank investments, uh, the linkages in terms of capital and in terms of labor flowing to African ports and African uh, French colonies uh, is notable in particular. So uh, these trends over these years see also the rise of mercantile classes of provenance from beyond Southeast Asia, most notably and famously uh, those uh, streaming into Southeast Asia from Fujian province uh, and Guangdong province, uh, the, the so-called Chinese. Uh, and then we see, of course, the Hadrami Arabs and the Chediar Indians uh, in, in different parts of Southeast Asia as well. And these trends are, are also accompanied by tightening links to other regions of the world beyond Europe, not only to China and to India, but also to the Middle East with uh, increasing numbers of pilgrims to Mecca and increasing numbers uh, of Southeast Asian scholars at the famous mosque university Al-Azhar in Cairo, increasingly exposed to uh, Islamic reformism by the turn of the 20th century. Thus, overall, alongside what we might think of as Andersonian trends of proto-nationalization, we see diverse hybrid forms of cosmopolitanism. And we can see this in terms of popular culture. You see tens of thousands of people uh, attending uh, the performances of the so-called Comedy Stambul, uh, a form of popular entertainment uh, really uh, originally uh, stemming from uh, the Parsi community in, in what today is Mumbai. We see the so-called Comedia um, in the Philippines with its diverse sorts of influences. The most famous 19th century uh, epic poet, poem uh, of the period in Tagalog uh, it all takes place in Albania uh, of, uh, of all places. A and the Vietnamese popular entertainment uh, Kai Luong with its mixed Chinese uh, and Western influences. So we can see even in terms of uh, everyday forms of popular entertainment in the cities and market towns of Southeast Asia, that what draws people into a shared experience uh, of popular culture is very cosmopolitan, very hybrid in terms of its origins and its points uh, of reference. And we see in, in different ways, uh, this period giving rise to uh, modern forms of expression and consciousness, new modern forms of learning, new experiments with modern forms of schooling, new modern forms of knowledge, new modern forms of associational activity, and thus new possibilities for doing modern politics. But the rise of modernity or of multiple modernities in Southeast Asia uh, in this kind of context over the late 19th century and early 20th century uh, is something that is, it does not necessarily lead to any specific outcome, whether revolutionary or otherwise. Uh, and so the, the sort of the trajectories that might flow from, uh, from the uh, economic, demographic, uh, social and cultural uh, transformations of this era you know, how we might link them to revolutions that happened in one way or another or revolutions that didn't happen at all remains to be explained. How can we explain these diverse forms of uh, revolutionary mobilization that we see across the Philippine, Indonesian and Vietnamese revolutions in particular? And here to go back to Al's introduction, I think that the tradition uh, that uh, really helps us in this regard is a tradition within and beyond Southeast Asian studies. And that is a tradition of comparative historical sociology. And so while on the one hand, uh, we might think of the importance of uh, inter-imperialist competition and conflict, major world wars and other kinds of international conjunctures, the Spanish-American War uh, in the case of the late 19th century Philippines, World War II, uh, most obviously 
in the case of Indonesia and Vietnam, but other conflicts as well, the Sino-Japanese War, the Russo-Japanese War, World War I, all very important. But beyond these sorts of international conjunctures, it seems to me, the real thrust of a comparative historical and sociological analysis uh, of these revolutions lies in a more structuralist kind of comparative historical sociology with an emphasis on the variance and how these different societies, these different Southeast Asian societies played host to different kinds and different constellations of cosmopolitan linkages, which provided institutional, organizational, and discursive bases for different kinds of revolutionary mobilization across these different countries. And so here in the book, and otherwise, I would suggest two elements of a comparative historical sociology of the region. And one is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the scholastic forms of cosmopolitanism that crystallized in the early modern era and are important in their varying tendencies, either towards absorption um, and integration uh, into the state uh, and or their elimination by the state, uh, something we see in the case of Vietnam, or their continued evolution and autonomy that we see in different ways uh, in the Philippines on the one hand uh, and uh, with Islam uh, in Indonesia on the other. But then secondly, and perhaps even more importantly and obviously, are the forms of class formation that we observe with the deepening integration of Southeast Asia into the world economy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, as we see the very distinctive patterns of class formation, both in terms of the dominant classes that emerge during this period, the, the sort of mercantile uh, proto-business classes, but also in terms of the subaltern classes, the working classes of the region, which differ in important ways. So let me give you a brief taste of how this kind of analysis might account for uh, you know, the differences we see across uh, the Philippine, Indonesian, and Vietnamese revolutions. If we take the Philippines, Catholic cosmopolitanism is integrated into, and indeed is constitutive of, the colonial state and the status quo from the mid 16th century into uh, the 19th century. But with the opening of Philippine ports to foreign firms came the emergence of an assimilated Chinese mestizo commercial landowning and at the local level governing class with increasingly intimate connections to forms of knowledge, power and associational activity outside and against the Catholic church. So for example, we see uh, Jose Rizal, the famous Filipino novelist uh, and uh, nationalist uh, hero uh, of the country, um, uh, having dinner with Rudolf Virchow, uh, the uh, German academic uh, and politician who leads the so-called Kulturkampf against the Catholic Church uh, in uh, late uh, 19th century Germany and Prussia. We also thus see the ascendancy of this class of fused economic, social, and political power, bringing it increasingly into conflict with the Catholic Church in a trend broadly overlapping and intersecting with the late 19th century culture wars that we see not only in what today is Germany, uh, but across Europe between the forces of liberalism and republicanism on the one hand that we, we see perhaps um, exemplified by the, the Freemasons uh, uh, and the so-called ultramontane uh, or ultramontanist church, Catholic church on the other. And thus against this backdrop, we see by 1888, local uh, worthies, local uh, Filipino government officials uh, petitioning for the expulsion of the religious orders uh, from uh, the archipelago. We see in 1892, the formation uh, of, of something called the La Liga Filipina calling for a similar set of reforms. And then in 1896, the mass mobilization of the Katipunan. Uh, and you know, if we try to understand uh, in uh, the Manila uh, chapters uh, of this uh, organization, the kinds of people who are drawn into its orbit, uh, we could take the, the famous case of Andres Bonifacio, whose 
whose origins and whose, whose kind of biography uh, is a source of great controversy uh, among historians even to this day. But what we do know about him is that he was an actor in the local comedia. We know he worked for a German for firm in Binondo, uh, Chinatown. And we know that uh, among the books in his library uh, was the, the famous wildly popular book, Le Juif Errant, The Wandering Jew, uh, which traces you know, the, the Jesuit conspiracies uh, uh, across Europe um, in, in, in a, a broad canvas novel. Um, that gives you a taste of what attracted to him, uh, what attracted him to, you know, a, a world of, of political activism uh, in which the Catholic Church figured uh, as a source uh, of constraint uh, on the emancipation of social, cultural, and political life uh, in the Philippines. So in other words, uh, what I'm suggesting uh, is that uh, we find uh, in the Philippines the first revolution in Southeast Asia, not because Filipinos were somehow more nationalist than other Southeast Asians, but because conditions for uh, a kind of almost 1848 style uh, Republican insurrection were riper in this context for the sociological reasons I've suggested already than anywhere else. Uh, but the Masonic lodges, the schoolboy networks, and the uh, Catholic sodalities that constituted the Katipunan and the, the so-called other Katipunans that were you know, in, in tension with the, the, the elite leadership of the Katipunan had limited organizational strength and limited egalitarian promise, uh, crumbling in the face not only of internal uh, fraction, fractiousness, uh, and internal rebellions, but also more brutally in the face of American military power um, as American forces uh, in the wake of uh, the events in Cuba and the onset of the Spanish-American War uh, engaged in violent so-called pacification across the aisles at the turn of the 20th century, establishing a form of what some have called colonial democracy that in many ways uh, provided you know, many of the kinds of uh, uh, outcomes that uh, had animated some of those uh, who had mobilized for a, a liberal uh, Republican Philippines um, in, in terms of a removal of the Catholic Church uh, uh, from uh, public life and from political troll, control and an empowerment uh, of many of the same uh, people who were, played such a crucial role in leading the revolution uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So if we then turn to uh, Indonesia, we see something very different. Um, and uh, here, the, the form of cosmopolitanism that we can identify uh, in the Indonesian case uh, is, is that associated with Islamic cosmopolitanism. But crucially, in stark contrast with what we see in neighboring British colonial Malaya by the, the, the final quarter of the 19th century, Dutch colonial rule in the Netherlands East Indies and the Indonesian archipelago was notable for the continuing autonomy, which was allowed uh, for Islam uh, and uh, the confinement of uh, local aristocracies as key partners of the Dutch uh, to forms of cultural uh, and symbolic production that did not give them custodianship uh, over uh, the judicial and educational institutions of the faith. Secondly, at the same time, in terms of the autonomous, uh, you know, alongside this autonomous form of Islamic practice and uh, education, and by the 20th century associational activity, the Dutch East Indies was also notable um, for uh, some other distinctive things. In contrast with the, the prevalence of smallholder and sharecropper agriculture in the Philippines, we see the elaboration of uh, really vast industrial style uh, plantations uh, across huge swathes of uh, Java and parts of Sumatra. Uh, and uh, alongside these plantations, the construction of huge vast railroad networks crisscrossing uh, Java in particular and providing the basis not only for a proto uh, agro-industrial economy, but also for a large scale wage labored working class for the first time. And then finally, it's worth noting, uh, instead of 
uh, an assimilated Chinese mestizo class with fused economic, social, and local power, we see the bifurcation of social, political, and economic power in the Dutch East Indies between a native aristocracy, uh, the Priyai uh, on Java on the one hand, and uh, a Chinese merchant class whose Chineseness uh, is uh, reified and reinforced under Dutch colonial uh, rules, uh, uh, such that uh, they are segregated, stigmatized as foreign, uh, and so forth. And these conditions, it seems to me, prefigured forms of associational activity and mobilization in the name of Islam on the one hand, given the autonomy of Islamic associational and educational activity that's quite striking under Dutch colonial rule, and uh, on the other, uh, communism. Uh, we see this with the Sadaqat Islam mobilizing in, in the first large scale sustained mass movement uh, in Southeast Asian history um, that goes on for a number of years in the 19 teens into the 1920s. Uh, and we also see uh, the rise of the first communist party uh, in Southeast Asia. 1920, we see the founding of the Communist Party of Indonesia, the Partai Komunis Indonesia, the PKI, uh, prior to the founding uh, by the same uh, Dutch Comintern agent uh, of the Chinese Communist Party nearby. So uh, in other words, uh, we, we can see uh, the emergence of Islam and communism as providing sort of infrastructures for mobilization uh, in Indonesia already by the 19 teens and into the early 1920s. Uh, and these infrastructures for mobilization uh, that then are insufficient for overthrowing the Dutch in the 1920s uh, and are brutally suppressed uh, after the failed rebellions of 1926, 1927, uh, they then resurface after years of underground and above ground uh, development over the intervening years, they resurface after if not during uh, the Japanese occupation uh, from 1942 through 1945. And they resurface in the midst of the messy uh, end of World War II with the Japanese surrender in uh, August of 1945, the declaration uh, of independence and the onset of the so-called revolusi. And what I think, uh, you know, close careful uh, analysis of province by province, the, the, the revolusi uh, reveals with you know his fantastic uh, historical research on the local forms of mobilization observed is that in the absence of the organizational and discursive resources provided by Islam on the one hand and communism on the other, the revolution would have had very uh, little oomph, very very little in the way of uh, of the, the kinds of energies. Um, uh, to mobilize against the Dutch in a diverse set of ways locally and with forms of solidarity and support from outside the archipelago through Islamic and communist networks uh, in different parts of the world, we see uh, a vigorous struggle against the Dutch, uh, but insufficient to, uh, to carry through a full-blown social revolution along Islamist or communist lines. And Islam and communism individually providing very powerful forces uh, and, and infrastructures for mobilization, but never combining successfully into a unified force and instead uh, at odds with one another and failing uh, to provide uh, a basis for a coherent or monolithic form of mobilization, thus leading to the messy and somewhat incomplete for many disappointing form of independence uh, that uh, belatedly uh, achieves uh, independence by the end of 1949, uh, carrying on uh, the fractiousness and the fierce forms of uh, you know, what internecine uh, warfare between these crucial forces mobilized in the revolution well into the 1960s. Sorry. So finally, if we turn to the case of Vietnam, it seems to me that against the backdrop of the Philippine and Indonesian revolutions, we can appreciate uh, some of the distinctive features of Vietnamese society uh, as it evolves in response to successive uh, waves of uh, development in, in tandem with its incorporation into uh, broader patterns of, of uh, 
trade and commerce and interaction with, with different parts of the world, uh, most notably neighboring China, and of course its immersion in the French empire and in French colonial Indochine. And here it seems to me that the distinctiveness of Vietnam in contrast and in comparison with the Philippines and Indonesia is uh, at least threefold. Uh, first of all, we see uh, in, in terms of sinographic cosmopolitanism, uh, the tradition of the four books and the five classics of uh, Chinese philosophy of so-called uh, Confucianism or Neo-Confucianism that we see uh, inherited uh, from the, the Vietnamese uh, imperial court uh, and carrying on at least in Annam and Tonkin into the first decade of the 20th century but then uh, eliminated, abolished um, by the 19 teens, um, meaning that thereafter, there's no longer a conservative patriarchal counterweight to other more radical bases for revolutionary mobilization, such as we find uh, among the, uh, the Filipino counterparts in the late 19th century on the one hand, or their Islamic counterparts in terms of the Islamic schools and the bases they provide for revolutionary mobilization in Indonesia by the 1940s. A second distinctive feature uh, of uh, Vietnam, it seems to me, is the, uh, the complete dwarfing of an indigenous Vietnamese capitalist class, not only by French uh, you know, and other European forms of capital, but also by uh, a segregated uh, immigrant Chinese community given the sheer uh, predominance of trade with China and particular the rice trade of Vietnamese uh, and Cambodian rice flowing to uh, Guangzhou uh, and Hong Kong under uh, the control of Chinese rice traders in a way that, that fails to produce uh, a local business class uh, in any way comparable either to their Chinese mestizo counterparts in the Philippines or even to uh, the Muslim merchants, uh, especially in the outer islands uh, or the batik merchants who play a role in the Sadaqat Islam. There's, there's, there's a very weak local Vietnamese business class. And, and these two features, it seems to me, provide a very kind of weak basis for any kind of Republican or uh, non-radical um, you know, form of mobilization. That there's no real cultural, social, or economic infrastructure uh, for the forms of mobilization that we might loosely describe as Republicans, such as we find in the late 19th century uh, in the Philippines. But then there is a third and perhaps even a fourth distinctive feature of Vietnam uh, that we also need to note. One is its integration within uh, this broader Indochine or Indochina. It's integration into Southern China economically very profoundly. And it's also deepening integration into the French empire with 100,000 Vietnamese uh, soldiers and coolie laborers uh, mixing and mingling with African counterparts uh, in France and elsewhere in Europe during and after World War I. Uh, and uh, Vietnam increasingly drawn into the broader arc of French imperial economic exploitation um, of, of colonies across Africa um, as well. And last but not least, there's the peculiarity of the Vichy Japanese condominium uh, during World War II, uh, which means that in contrast with Indonesia uh, and uh, Sukarno uh, or uh, Burma and Aung San, is there's no entrenched non-communist nationalist government uh, put in power by the, the, the Japanese uh, until the very last moment and very weakly uh, in a way that would, would uh, again provide another basis, uh, another kind of infrastructure uh, for mobilization. So against this backdrop, it seems to me that we can identify the kind of weak institutional and social bases for uh, republicanism on the one hand and the porousness of Vietnam and its sensitivity to developments elsewhere, especially in China in the 1920s, um, uh, the importance of China and the Guomindang troops actually in uh, securing uh, North Vietnam uh, in 1946. Uh, and then of course the Chinese victory uh, in 1949 
uh, which allows for uh, a shared border uh, with China uh, that allows for uh, logistical uh, support for the embryonic Democratic Republic of Vietnam uh, and the Viet Minh in their struggle against uh, the French. So in all of these ways, and I'm obviously uh, you know, giving you a very abbreviated version of this, what I'm suggesting is that it's not something very innately, ineffably, essentially Vietnamese in terms of some kind of very strong sense of Vietnamese culture that really distinguishes Vietnam from these other countries in Southeast Asia in terms of what turns out to be the most really uh, steadfast or stubborn, uh, strongest, um, most solidified, most monolithic um, uh, form of revolutionary mobilization that we see uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s and onwards, uh, arguably up into 1975, uh, if not beyond. But it's instead the really diverse and for the French, very dangerous kinds of external influences that uh, percolate into Vietnamese society and politics, and that Vietnamese revolutionaries draw upon so creatively and effectively in waging revolution. So it's, it's, it's their, uh, their access to and their ability to make much of uh, a diverse set of opportunities uh, and uh, organizational tools uh, that come from without, uh, that makes for success, uh, as well as you know, a, a set of circumstances, the, uh, the difficulties the French are, are, are facing in the late 40s and holding together uh, their empire more generally uh, that make it possible for the Viet Minh to survive uh, until 1949, uh, at which point they have uh, the Chinese next door uh, to help them seal the deal. So against this backdrop, what I'm suggesting overall, it seems to me, um, is that if we look across the um, uh, the three revolutions that we find in Southeast Asia, um, that we can see that they, they can be understood not only as nationalist revolutions, but also as revolutions whose distinctive timing, trajectories, form, and outcome can be understood from a, a, a broader, shall we say, denationalized, internationalized, transnationalized perspective that uh, incorporates and emphasizes the varying uh, capacities of local actors, of these local societies, to uh, make use of opportunities and infrastructures for mobilization uh, that allow them to make different kinds of revolutions at different times under different circumstances in these different countries. And so what I, I hope I've done in the book and what I've given you, I hope I've given you a taste of in the lecture is the, the potential for this kind of comparative analysis that it seems to me hopefully avoids uh, both the limitations uh, of a, a purely nationalist temp template intellectually, but also uh, the political dangers of what Ben Anderson called official nationalism. In other words, appropriating uh, you know, uh, the heroes, uh, the selected heroes uh, for, uh, of a nationalist struggle um, for a, a, uh, a nation state, in particular a state to celebrate and appropriate uh, and absorb uh, into its authoritarian uh, power structures uh, for itself by showing the importance of non-nationals, uh, of also RANs, uh, and of, of those who, who don't end up uh, victorious uh, in all of these struggles. But beyond these revolutions and beyond the book, what I, I hope I've uh, helped to suggest for all of you students of Southeast Asia and contributors to Southeast Asian studies going forward um, is uh, the possibility of opening up um, and acknowledging uh, on the basis of existing scholarship by a wide range of historians of the importance of uh, all of these connections between the region and the rest of the world. Um, that Southeast Asians, of course, uh, made their own histories, but did so in circumstances not entirely of their own making. They made globalization in the 16th century. They've been globalized ever since then. And that's an important uh, basis on which we can understand uh, their history, their modern history, if not 
you know, their history going back centuries and centuries uh, ago. So I'll stop here. Many thanks. Uh, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Seidel, um, for that wonderful talk. Um, we have about 10 minutes um, for discussion, maybe one or two questions. Um, you can either put your question in the chat or raise your hand um, and we'll go from there. Any questions? I All right. I guess Professor Seidel, you covered everything. <laughs> Send everyone into silence. Great. Well, would you be willing if oh, Al has a question. You're on mute. Uh, John, um, I was struck by uh, both your departure from and your affirmation of your the intellectual tradition in which you were formed. In other words, you began among the many texts that you cited with Ben Anderson's very important work, Imagine Communities on Nationalism, and you argued that you know he portrayed a portrait of basically similarity, if not simultaneity, in the emergence of nationalism and what you said you wanted to do was both, you know, to, to, to both to complicate that by going deeper into the roots of nationalism, and yet at the same time, moving out to the global. And and you know, I wonder if you could talk about the way that you perform this sort of incredible balancing act of moving simultaneously from the global to the national, and then as you do in your in in, in your in, in the clauses of your work and in the cases that these these very localized movements. Uh, you know, how, how do you keep doing that? How does that work intellectually? Uh, and, and are there any tensions, any compromises that you have to make? Things you leave out, things you smooth over, you know, sort of the, the way you work this. Uh, that's a tough question, of course. Um, I, I began writing the book a long time ago with the, the narrow focus on, um, on the revolutions, but I ended up more and more getting into the backstory and wanting to show that you know the, the the societies the social formations that that provided the backdrop that the making of a vietnamese society a philippine society an indonesian society um and here you know you're you're at siasi in terms of the, the languages i mean if you think of the languages of the region that they they you know really drew on a diverse set of influences. So there is a kind of tendency in the book to pile on or, or a temptation in the book to pile on that kind of analysis um, and to emphasize that. Um, but I think what I, what I think I'm, if, if it's not just cherry picking and um, sort of piling on the detail, I think I, I'm very attracted to and very um, emphatic in the book on the importance of economic history. And I think it is, uh, there's an underlying logic in the book that, um, that identifies the forms of cosmopolitanism and connections um, with uh, patterns of economic linkage, um, and economic change uh, that, that, that differ across these cases. And so I think that, um, you know, that in terms of, I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question, but I think that I, I, I'm trying to, to set the stage for uh, a set of developments that I'm showing was a set of developments that was enabled by preconditions um, that require one to see the evolution of these Southeast Asian societies in step with their, you know, the, the, their shifting incorporation into broader patterns of 
commerce and connectedness, um, not only economic, but religious. Um, and so I think that's the, that provides a kind of underlying infrastructure for the book, an underlying kind of grid for the book. Even if you know there there is the temptation and tendency in the book to go off on tangents, so I I start the first chapter of the Philippine on the Philippine Revolution in a little town outside Prague, and then I go on and, and try and explain why why that's helpful. I, I I start the first of five chapters on the Indonesian Revolution in Baku in what's today Azerbaijan, and and try and explain why that's helpful, and then. In the Vietnamese Revolution chapters, three chapters, I begin in Guangzhou for obvious reasons, but then also in two, two cities in Africa, Porto, uh, Porto Novo and uh, Antananarivo um, in Madagascar for reasons that I, I also explain. So, so I think there's that kind of tendency. Uh, follow, quick follow-up question then I'll, you know, I think there may be a couple of questions coming in. Since it is Yasi, Okay, one of the things that you've always done as a scholar is learn multiple languages. And I noticed that you've, you've worked in both Cebuano and Filipino. So first thing, how did your study of Southeast Asian languages inform this, this, this study, allow you to capture the kind of complexities of cultural resonances as regional, national, and international cultures collide? And second of all, what is the study of a regional language simultaneous with a national language give you a sort of a depth of understanding about the emergence of nationalism? I realize that's a big question. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, for, for purposes of the book, um, having Southeast Asian, but also non-Southeast Asian languages was really helpful. So... Um, How so? Well, for, for example, in, in having Tagalog meant I could read some sources in Tagalog uh, about the Katipunan, about the revolution. Um, so that 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 you know was helpful. I, I don't remember there being any Cebuano sources, sadly. Indonesian. Th there's there's a whole body of literature that you have to read. You have to know how to read Indonesian to be able to read. In terms of secondary sources, uh, and you know, and some sort of memoirs, uh, a bit of that, like Tan Malaka. Um, but some of these things have also been translated into English. But nonetheless, getting the to some of these original sources was really helpful. Um, Vietnamese, I don't speak, um, but there's a, a great literature in French, which I can read. Uh, uh, there's some sources in Russian. I studied Russian for six years and spent a summer in Moscow and Leningrad studying Russian. So I, I got to go back and there's lots of, you know, literature in Russian that was helpful. Uh, so th those having different languages made for, you know, a broader appreciation of available secondary literatures and in some cases, primary sources. Um, so I think, you know, it, it yeah, it, it, it's really, it, it's really valuable to have that. Could you have done it without the languages? I, I think it would have been much weaker, much more superficial. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. So a couple questions in the hmm. chat. Um, okay. The first one is, could you explore a bit more? of how certain forms of popular culture associated with the spread of cosmopolitanism and nationalist spirit? Mm. Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, so there, there's a, a great literature on the comedy Istanbul, on the Comedia, um, on, um, you know, on Kai Luang to a lesser extent. Uh, but what we find uh, cultural and social historians producing over the past 20, 30 years is an account of Southeast Asian societies in the late 19th and early 20th century, in which you see Southeast Asians engaged in new forms of expression, consciousness, um, and, and you know, debate that really shows how widely they, they drew their net uh, in, in terms of different influences and, and different forms of experimentation politically, socially, and culturally. So I, I, I don't sort of draw a direct line to, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, the comedy Istanbul straight to the revolution. But if you look at the fact that uh, Bonifacio uh, was an actor in the Commedia, if you look at the uh, role of journalists in the making of the Sadakat Islam uh, in the Indies in the 19 teens, you can see that um, the new media the new forms of popular expression, the, the, the new press, um, 
really, uh, these are, are crucial for connecting crowds, for connecting people together in new ways. And in terms of the kind of excitement and experimentation that we see in the cultural realm, I think that there's a connection between that and politics. So I think I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. And then I think the last question we'll have time for um, today would be, could you speak to how your model differ, differs from Takashi Shiraishi's work and the notion of the formation of an East Asian regional system? Well, it, 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 it's funny that you mention uh, Takashi Shiraishi because he was, uh, he, he was uh, on my PhD dissertation committee and, and taught a course on modern Southeast Asian history that I took as a PhD student and his book, um, An Age in Motion, and before that, his, his PhD thesis really uh, influenced me a great deal. And, and I think my, my whole account of the Indonesian revolution is very influenced by, by him in that regard. And I haven't seen him for a long time and, and sent him a copy of, of the book and have been in correspondence uh, with him since then. And I'm not sure I, I know what you refer to here in terms of a, an East Asian regional system. Um, so I, I should investigate uh, his writings on that. But I think um, I see in the case of Vietnam that it's really crucial um, to understand how tightly integrated the Vietnamese economy was, uh, the Mekong Delta and elsewhere into the, the, the economy of Southern China. Um, but I, I don't see the, uh, a kind of East Asian regional system during this period is, I, I, I don't see, it's hard for me to see this kind of systemic kind of properties in, in those terms, in that kind of geographic kind of system. So Nicole, Ku Unjeng Aboites' uh, recent book that emphasizes the kind of Asian dimensions of the Philippine Revolution is very interesting, but I see very different connections for the Philippine Revolution. And I see the connections between Southeast Asia and the Middle East as being important, uh, Vietnam and Africa as being important in ways that probably don't fully overlap with Takashi's um, uh, account. So I, I should thank you for that reference. Uh, I always like Takashi's work. And he, he's a very interesting thinker. So um, I will investigate that. Thank you for the tip. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Seidel and Al for the wonderful introduction. Um, Al, do you have one more comment? You're muted. As per program agenda, should I close by thanking Professor Seidel? Sounds good, Al. Okay, thank you. And Jinda, I want to thank you and Nisi for superb hosting. It was absolutely seamless, no glitches. I don't know what's what's wrong. You know, as technology <laughs> improved, have we become more deaf? But we had a glitch-free hour and a half, which was a joy in itself. And that was your work, and we thank you for it. Uh, and while we're thanking, I want to thank John Seidel for an absolutely superb and stimulating presentation every word, every clause in those passages from the book that you posted made me realize that I need to give the book a close and careful read to try and understand what you're talking about. We all know we live in a globalized era that globalization is a part of every region, but the way you brought it into the region in such, in such a careful way and yet so broadly construed at the same time, um, very intriguing, very intriguing. And, and so we want to thank you for a very stimulating presentation and for a a, a wonderful book. Thank you, John. Many thanks. Really appreciate it.